Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. We've been in Revelation 13 now for about three weeks. And last week, we started just by reading the 13th chapter of Revelation, which we could do again. We could probably do this every Sunday for the next year, there is enough there to keep us going. But what I wanted to do was continue what we talked about last week. The beast out of the sea represents one of the oldest prophecies in the Bible. Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, in pure raw terms, this beast out of the sea is the sea monster, and he is called Tanin in the Old Testament. And the sea monster is a figure that really goes back into the early, early, early parts of every culture on earth, way back before Babylon, the days of Nimrod, the idea of the sea monster. Even before the flood in the book of Enoch, you encounter the idea of the sea monster, and he is imbued or invested with certain kinds of powers, and in prophecy he grows in power until at last he is destroyed. This is called the Octomus in Jewish lore, the story of how the sea monster will eventually be killed. And so John brings it into Revelation through this vision. I stood upon the sand of the sea, and of course the sand of the sea representative of the people, the sea, the multitudes, the nations, and this beast has seven heads and ten horns. And I thought we would continue this week talking about the nature of this beast Last week, we talked about the four elements of the Gentile world powers. Beast number one, Babylon, having a lion-like configuration. Lion with the head of a man and wings of an eagle. Medo-Persia, the bear. Greece, the leopard with four wings. And finally, the fourth beast, described by Daniel, as indescribable. Daniel says, I can't describe the beast. He's so horrible. But he's different from all the other beasts that went before him. And we describe the differences. The fourth beast, Rome, the Roman Empire, began a new system called imperialism. And Rome became an imperial power. That is to say, it appointed administrators, procurators, to administer all of its possessions all over the world. And in fact, you could say that Roman imperialism really never has died, even to this very day. The European Union, which people used to look at 10, 15 years ago as maybe the precursor of the final world system, I don't believe that at all. I think the world system is global and not European. But the whole EU, European Union concept, basically is an imperial concept based upon the idea of having administrators administer various territories in a financial realm. And so that is exactly what we see developing. Now, Rome never could create an imperial empire that was undivided. It attempted to do so, but after the Lord came and after his resurrection, Rome began to have some internal splits. And by the time of Constantine in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, Rome had split into the eastern and western division of the empire. And of course, Daniel even prophesied that Rome would be split into two pieces, but that the two pieces would, for a time in the end of days, come back into one government. And I think we see that whole situation developing right now. Daniel sees this fourth beast empire eventually breaking down into 10 divisions that are administered by a central imperial power. And he sees it in the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream as the 10 toes of that statue. He also sees it as 10 horns on the head of the fourth beast. So this idea of a 10-unit 
imperial power in the last day is really securely developed in the Bible. Now, getting back to Revelation 13, John sees a beast. He describes the beast. In a sense, he described the beast back in chapter 7 of Revelation. But here the beast is given a description. It has ten horns. It has seven heads. The ten horns we've already seen are found back in Daniel chapter 7. And they represent ten, if you will, procurates or administrative divisions. And they become the fourth stage of imperialism in the way the Bible describes the final latter-day coalescence of powers. The beast incorporates all of the powers that went before it. That would be the Greek, Medo-Persian, and Babylonian powers going all the way back to Nimrod. In verse 3 of Revelation chapter 13, And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. All the world wondered after the beast. Now, a lot of people have interpreted this as one of the divisions of this beast empire in the end of days dies or dries up and blows away. And then after that, this power comes back to life again and metaphorically its deadly wound is healed and all the world wonders after it. Actually, that interpretation just doesn't work. A lot of people have seen maybe one nation die and then come back, maybe like the Soviet Union dwindling into nothingness and then popping back into full power or something like that. But in fact, it really doesn't work in this context because we've seen nations die and reemerge again, and the world doesn't particularly wonder after them. It's not particularly a miracle to see a nation wane away and come back. We're talking about one of the literal heads and we're talking specifically about the Antichrist, and we're talking specifically about a deadly wound. And this becomes a very big picture, as we'll see, in understanding the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a god, lowercase g. A lot of people don't think of the Antichrist as a god. They think of him as sort of a fancy presidential candidate or something, maybe a fancy head of state in Europe some kind of a really gifted human being. But in the context of what we have seen developing in Revelation, we see that by the time the beast is fully revealed, the bottomless pit has been opened, the world has been ravaged by the visible appearance of demons, there are the appearances of the ancient fallen angels who empower their followers to do great miracles. It's going to be a time of almost of magic and a time of, if you will, superpowers, a time when people will be able to do things that will dazzle other people. And it'll be a time when People are saying, well, you know, Christ is over there in that country. We believe Christ is over there. No, Christ really lives over here in this other country. Or there will be news reports that such and such a person in such and such a country claims to be Christ. And Jesus even warned about that. In the latter days, he said, if you see Christ-like figures appearing, forget about it. There's only one. And so it's going to be a time of miracles. The seventh head is smitten. We talked about this last week a little bit. And I think verse 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. The Greek means literally wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now, I'm one of those who believes there is a satanic trinity represented in Revelation just as there is a godly trinity in the rest of the Bible. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are represented in the negative form in the book of Revelation. Of course, the Father is God Almighty. The Son is Jehovah, who became the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit has the role of glorifying the Father and the Son. That is, the Holy Spirit is the agency and the power empowering us as we glorify God. And so his job is to point to Jesus 
and to say, look at Jesus and look at what he has done. We find exactly that same situation in Revelation. And you can think of Satan as the father. We don't often think of Satan as a father figure, but he is seen here in Revelation chapter 13 as the beast who is like a dragon, has seven heads, ten horns, upon his horns, ten crowns, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast is described in verse 2 as looking like a leopard, a bear, a lion, but in his heart he is a dragon, and the dragon is Satan. In fact, I looked up, just before I came over here today, all the times that the word dragon appears in Scripture, just for fun. And I discovered that in the Bible, the word dragon appears 19 times. You could make something out of that if you wanted to. He appears six times in the Old Testament and 13 times in the New Testament. And always, when the dragon appears... He is busy doing something that in some way undercuts or undermines the progress toward the kingdom of God on earth. That is to say, his role, and has been his role for thousands of years, is to delicately and subtly undermine and undercut the development of the kingdom. And so in these 19 times, we see in, for example, Ezekiel 29, 3, speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which has said the river is mine, mine own, I've made it for myself. So here the dragon is the power behind Egypt. Well, guess what? Does that surprise anybody? What was the symbol of power among the pharaohs? The serpent. The headdress had the serpent sticking out of the front of it, you know? And so it comes as no surprise and what is Egypt in the Bible? Egypt is the counterforce to Israel. The Israelites went down to Egypt where they were enslaved. God freed them. They then went across the Red Sea to Mount Horeb and so forth. But in a sense, they were having a battle with the dragon because the dragon is the force behind Egypt. Well, the dragon is also the force behind the entire world. Egypt is a type of the world. And we see that in Revelation 13, where the personage who gives power to this beast in Revelation 13, 1, is the dragon. The dragon is Satan. In the satanic trinity, Satan represents the father. That is, he is the antithesis of God the Father. And we have the son. Notice in chapter 13, verse 4 of Revelation, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast. The dragon is Satan. The beast is the Antichrist. He is the son. So the Antichrist, being Antichrist, is a false son of God. And what he does is imitate or counterfeit all of the things that Jesus did while he was on earth, including receiving a deadly wound, and then coming back to life again. I really believe that the Antichrist will exhibit a false resurrection. And people will say, this is the true Christ. And they really will believe that he is the true Christ. So you have here the dragon giving power to the beast. They worship the beast, saying, who's like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? In other words, the Antichrist is the most powerful force on earth all distilled into one human being. It's very difficult for us to imagine that right now. We tend to read Revelation in terms of what we see in front of us, that the situation that we have in the world will be the same as that in the future. And that's not true. The world is going to absolutely be overturned in some amazing way that I think is difficult for us to understand. And, verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, them that dwell in heaven. And we noticed last week that the Antichrist has power not only on earth, but against heaven itself. He blasphemes heaven. 
And he does it apparently without fear of opposition, at least at this stage in his development. And God allows this to happen. This beast. Let's stop for a minute. Satan is the father. The Antichrist or the beast is the son. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 17. The angel describes a woman called Mystery Babylon and a beast. And the woman rides the beast. Now the beast, I think, is a metaphor for the Antichrist. But for the time being, let's not talk about the woman and the beast. Let's skip down to Revelation 17, 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee of the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. And again, we see the seven heads and ten horns, just as in Daniel chapter 7, in Revelation 13, we see the whole thing repeated here. I will tell thee of the mystery of the woman, Revelation 17, 7, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. What's John talking about here? He's talking about a continuity of power that has essentially been running from Babylon to the present. It's running right now. In other words... If you think that we're living in an era of peace and prosperity, which in a sense we have in the United States, in fact, the world system always has been indescribably evil. It is right now indescribably evil. There are great powers behind the scenes running it. So this continuity of powers, Revelation 17.10, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, I've seen so many dissertations upon these kings who have been and who are not now. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. Interesting that this beast now is called the eighth. This beast imitates Jesus even in the way he operates. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Of course, that beast is the Antichrist. And he's called the eighth. Why is he called the eighth? Because in the Bible, the number eight is the number of superabundance. It's the number of the new birth. It is the number that always represents a new order of things. For example, what was Noah called? Noah is referred to as the eighth man. Why? Because Noah came across, he had a family of seven, and he's the head of the family, he's the eighth, and he took humanity across the flood into a new birth. So Noah is called the eighth man. Everywhere you run into the number eight, you run into superabundance or perfection. For example, Elijah the prophet did eight major miracles. Double that, Elisha the prophet did 16 miracles. Just a double eight, if you will. Even the name of Jesus reflects the number eight. And I'm sure that many of you know that when you spell Jesus, Jesus in Greek, his name is spelled Yota, Ita, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma. And those each have a number attached to them. The Yota is 10, the Ita is 8, the Sigma is 200, the Omicron is 70, Upsilon is 400, and the Sigma is 200. And if you add up the letters in the name of Jesus, the Gematria is 888. So the number of Jesus is 888. 
just like the number of the beast is 666. And when you begin to look at these things, and then you go back to the 11th verse that we just read, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Let's talk for a minute about the beasts. And by the way, I'm trying to make this very simple, but there's no way to make this simple. <laughs> well, when you start using language like the beast that was and is not and yet is, you know right away you're in for quite a ride because that's metaphorical language. But how do you look at global history and see these nations? I think the best explanation I've ever seen was given by Dr. Fruchtenbaum, and he talks about seven powers. And these seven powers are seven divisions of the Roman Empire. And if you read about the Roman Empire historically, you will discover that historians divide it into seven specific divisions of power. The first powers in Rome were the Tarquin kings, descended from the Etruscans. The Tarquin kings of Rome reigned from 753 to 510 BC. After that came a period known as the period of the counselors, second period in Rome. The third period of Roman rule was called the period of the dictators, 494 to 390. The fourth era of rule in Rome was called the era of the Republicans or the Decemvirs. The next period of rule was called the Triumvirate period, 59 to 27. And then comes the sixth. That would be the sixth head. And the period of rule described in Rome began in 27 BC. And will continue from 27 BC into the middle of the tribulation period. Because notice what John is saying. Here's the mind which hath wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. These mountains are not a city. They're not any city on earth. There are a lot of cities that claim to have seven hills or seven mountains. Rome does. Jerusalem does. So a lot of people have said, well, these seven heads might represent Jerusalem. They might represent Rome. I think they go beyond that. I think the seven mountains are seven divisions of power. And there are seven kings, five fallen, one is, the others not yet come. So when John was alive, five of these powers had come and gone. One was in existence. The five powers would be divisions of the Roman Empire. The Tarquins, the Counselors, the Plebeians, the Republicans, and the Triumvirate were gone. The sixth one now is. In other words, in 27 BC and on to the end of the first century when John was alive, the sixth head began the period of Roman imperialism under the Flavians well, the House of Germanicus, the Flavians, and the other Roman rulers that stood up in the place of the Flavians, and they were called the Imperial Romans. And that period was in power when John wrote this. So that's why he says, five are fallen. Verse 10, there are seven kings, or seven, if you will, powers or forms of government. Five are fallen. One is, that is, one now exists. Well, the one that now existed when John was alive was the Flavian power. It was the power of imperial Rome. It existed from 27 BC and onward. And the other is not yet come. Who is the other that's not yet come? That's the Antichrist. Well, there's a long, long gap between 27 BC and the coming of the Antichrist. But John writes it as though it's just all happening, bang, 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 one thing after another. But that's the way the Bible works. You can't tell just by going from one sentence to another that things are happening in serial order with no space between. Again, you might have another interpretation for these kings. And I've read several interpretations. 
But the one I like, I think, is Dr. Fruchtenbaum's. He talks about divisions of the Roman Empire. And it makes sense to me because it says, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. Well, that short space is three and a half years or 42 months when he comes to absolute power and then he is taken out at the end of the tribulation. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. There is one head still to come, the seventh head, the Antichrist stage, the stage of absolute imperialism. He stays three and a half years. So these seven heads could represent the various forms of Roman rule. Now, after the reference to the resurrection, which we read back in, in Revelation 13, John describes the position of the Antichrist as being the eighth, but of the seven. He is of the seven in that there are seven heads. The Antichrist is the seventh head. The heads are chronological. They are sequential. They come one after another with the Antichrist being the last to appear in the final period of the history of the seven heads, but he's also the eighth. In what way? How in the world can he be the seventh and the eighth? And that's seen in the relationship to the ten horns. The ten horns represent the ten kingdoms that come out of the one world government. It's the fourth stage of the fourth Gentile empire of imperialism, the ten kings are contemporary. They rule together. But go back to Daniel chapter 7. When the Antichrist begins to take control, he uproots three of the ten horns. He kills three of the ten kings and he leaves seven for the remainder of the tribulation period. The Antichrist is contemporary with these seven, making him the eighth. So there are ten Three are wiped out. Antichrist takes over. He is the seventh head, but he's also the eighth head. He is an eighth contemporary king with the seven. He is of the seven. He is the seventh in this chronological historical rule of governments. The term seven refers to heads. The term eight refers to horns. Told you it was complicated. Anytime you try to unscramble this particular omelet, you know, your brain begins to smoke because it's a very complicated thing. But it's complicated because we're dealing with something totally unaccustomed in human terms. It's not very often that somebody dies and then is resurrected and comes back to be something else. That doesn't happen, but once in a couple of millenniums or so. And he stages a false resurrection. That is, Satan stages a false resurrection of the Antichrist to emulate Christ. And in so doing, he then fulfills this idea. Five are fallen. One is. The other is not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. The beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth, is of the seven, and he goes into perdition. Verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. That hour would be sort of like a season. That is, an hour would be a designated period of rule and not to be taken as a literal 60-minute hour. So, back to Revelation 13. I saw, verse 3, one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. All the world wondered after the beast. They worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who's like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking great things. That's like Daniel's little horn that has a mouth speaking great things. And the little horn, remember, is the one who rises up, does away with three of the ten, leaving seven, and he becomes the eighth. But he's also the seventh, which is how that sort of a mystical, magical number can shift the way it does. 
And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, while this is all going on, We have another act, if you will, over here in another part of the stage, which is the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel who are basically evangelizing the world at the time that this is going on. During his climb to power and even as he rises to power, you have this amazing undercurrent of uh, Christian revival. And so you've got an incredible conflict of powers of various kinds. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. To be written in the Lamb's book of life is what precisely? Is that just a symbolic thing? Like when you receive Christ, there's a kind of an angel up there who takes a quill pen and dips it in some heavenly ink and uh, it looks like Gary Stearman has accepted Jesus. I'm going to write him down here. Like that. Is that what it means to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I don't think so. I think what it means is that your eternal existence becomes solidified and guaranteed at that point. Because to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life means to have your person inscribed in that book. Not just a name, but who you are, your entire DNA structure, your behavioral record, everything that constitutes everything you were, everything you are, and probably everything you will be. I don't know that you can say that for sure. But that book is more than just a name written on a line. That book is you. It is your personal identity complete with a new name which is written, and no man will know that name except the one who writes it. To be written in the Lamb's Book of Life is to be guaranteed personhood for eternity. If you are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are not a person. Heaven help you. You're not a whole person. You're just a part of something that you could have been, and you will scream forever that you did not follow the Lord Jesus Christ because you've lost whatever it was you could have become. If any man have an ear, let him hear. There really is a book, and it really is you. It's got you written in it. Everything you are is written in it. I don't even know how long the entry would be. In terms of earth books, your entry might be a 1,000 pages long, maybe 10,000 pages. I don't know. But there's a lot. Think of how long it would take just to write your DNA code. That's a bunch of pages right there. But your DNA code is written there, and how do I know? Because if I fall in the sea and my body is eaten by numerous fish and I become separated into molecules throughout all of the oceans of the world, on Resurrection Day, I'll still be resurrected because the Lord has my DNA. He knows exactly how I go together. Poof, I will be there not only in my form, but in a better form. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So the 10 verses that we just covered in Revelation 13 are 10 verses that describe the dragon and the beast who represent the Father and the Son of the unholy trinity. The next few verses represent the Holy Spirit in a negative form, and he is called the beast out of the earth. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, That is to say, he appeared to have some of the attributes of Christ, and he spoke as a dragon. So he's a false force, speaking as Christ, but empowered by Satan. He exerciseth all the power 
of the first beast before him, caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by the sword and did live. So what's the function of the beast out of the earth? He functions exactly as the divine Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God always points to God the Father this beast out of the earth as the false Holy Spirit always points to Satan and to the Antichrist. He glorifies the Antichrist. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. He urges those who dwell on the earth to worship the beast. That they should make an image to the beast. Verse 15, he had the power to give life to the image of the beast. Well, that's exactly the function of the Holy Spirit. Here we have the false prophet, which is the false version of the Holy Spirit. He has the power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should, would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so here we have the false prophet devoting his entire existence to pointing at the Antichrist, saying, worship this man, build images to him, worship the images of him. And by doing that, he's functioning exactly as our Holy Spirit functions toward God. Our Holy Spirit is doing the same thing. Our Holy Spirit points us toward Christ, worship Christ. Our Holy Spirit points us toward God the Father, saying, worship God the Father. And it is through the power of the Spirit that we worship God the Father this is going to be the exact reverse of that. If you can imagine such a thing, that dark, horrible situation in which there is actually a spirit that has the power to make the beast godlike, and the beast is going to stand up, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to stand up in the holy place and proclaim that he is God. Verse 16, And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now we just pointed out a minute ago that Gematria, that is, the Greek and Hebrew languages, each of their letters is also a number. And so every name has a numerical value. In Greek, the name Jesus has the numerical value of 888. Probably, since the New Testament is written in Greek, the number of whoever this man is is going to total 666. We don't know who he is right now. There have been a lot of candidates. But the Gematria somehow the people who are alive at that time will be able to take this man's name and reduce it to a number and thus ascertain for certain that he is the prophesied dark personality. Now, the beast out of the earth, verses 11 through 18, is the false prophet. He is referred to in Revelation 16, for example, Revelation 16, 13, where we have this unholy trinity popping up. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the prophet, a false prophet. So you have there this trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. In Revelation 19, 20, you see the three mentioned again. Revelation 19, 20, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So at this point in time, first of all, you have the beast and the false prophet thrown into this lake of fire. And then in Revelation chapter 20, you have the story of how 
Satan himself is going to finally be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. All of this is coming. Why is this here for us to read? I don't think it's here for us to read as much as the people who will be alive during the tribulation. They will read this and they will ponder it and puzzle over it and they'll say, this is what's happening right now. They'll be able to look at this and discern the truth of what's happening in their age, whenever that is. I don't know when this is going to happen, sometime in the future. And when it does, the people alive at that time will be able to read and interpret these verses. For us at this time, it's useful to read this because it helps us to see that things are happening right now. It's not like we've been dropped on this planet and left all alone and we just have to kind of hang out here with the food and water that we've got until help shows up. Actually, we're given a lot of insight into what's going on. And we're given a lot of insight into the world so that when we see things on the news and we see things happening, we know that there is a larger picture going on behind the visible picture. And we are comforted because we can understand to some degree what is in the process of being developed. And that's why I think these words are here for us to read. Jesus, the Gematria of Jesus, 888. The Gematria of the Antichrist, 666. And here is the number. And I mentioned last week, and I want to mention it again because it's fascinating. There are two textual traditions that is, there are two historical texts from which the New Testament is taken. There is the Southern Syriac tradition and the Northern Byzantine tradition. The Southern Syriac tradition has given rise to the modern versions of the Bible. The Byzantine Greek text is the one called the Textus Receptus. It was used for the King James Bible, which is why I like to read the King James Bible, because I like the Greek text better than it came from. The Syriac texts say, here is the number of a man, and his number is hexacosioi hexacanta hex, 666. That's what the Syriac text says. The Byzantine text says, here is the number of a man, and his number is chi xi stigma. It just uses three Greek letters. 666. And the chi is a cross. The xi is a serpent. And the stigma is a mark. So there are three letters that represent 666. The cross, the serpent, and the mark. And for that reason, I believe that chi, xi, stigma is the correct Greek rendering. His number is 603 score and 6. The cross and the serpent and the mark. It tells the story of redemption, really, 666. The cross upon which Jesus died, the serpent, through whose action it was that Jesus had to go to the cross, and the stigma, terminal S in Greek, is called a stigma. Well, everybody knows what a stigma is, right? Stigmata. It's a mark. Like if you drive a nail through your hand, you're going to have a scar. That is a stigma or a mark. And so in Greek, the number of the man is chi, the cross, xi, the serpent, and stigma, the mark. <laughs> 